at this time, uh, we're going to start our patient advocate panel. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Christine Hanlon and Brandon Lishner and um, Alyssa Kelly to the stage. They are our patients and advocates, respectively. And as they come up, I have to say that when we put the program together, we made a mistake and forgot to sign in a moderator to this particular session. And so somebody suggested, Kyle, why don't you do that? And I realized that this is actually the session, if I got to make a choice, uh, to be the one that I would want to moderate. It was uh, several years ago at the Onco Fertility. Actually, I should tell you a little bit about me. Most of you probably know. But I'm a basic scientist. I study stem cells, and I think about ways to use stem cells to treat human disease. And my favorite disease is infertility. And we've been working hard on that problem for almost 20 years now. But uh, where I really derived a motivation for the work that we do in the laboratory is when I heard one of these patient advocate panels at a prior oncofertility meeting many years ago. And you guys are the ones that inspire what we do. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the microphones over to you guys. You can take turns telling your story. Uh, just for all of you in the audience, this is Christine Hanlon, closest to me. And we'll just go in the order that you're in the program. Uh, Brandon Listener is next, and then Alyssa Kelly's on the end. And you guys can just take turns telling your stories. This is a pan it's a patient advocate panel by name, and actually it's a panel that has both patients and advocates on it. So thank you guys very much for coming. Hello, I'm Christine Halen. And uh, forgive me in advance, I have my notes, which I will be reading to help me stay focused with my story. Um, first, I'd like to say I'm grateful to Dr. Kyle Orwick, his wife, Jen, excuse me, his wife, Jen, and their amazing team for all the work they have done and continue to do with preserving fertility for helping others to have the most precious gift of life. It's truly remarkable. I am thankful for this opportunity to share my story from 11 years ago. I am a single mom of one child, my son, Dylan Halen. Dylan turned 21 years old on March 29th. I thank God that Dylan remains cancer-free today. I am a legal assistant and have been working with and for attorneys and paralegals for over 30 years. Five days after Dylan and I returned from Pittsburgh 11 years ago, I made a journal entry of our experience, which is what I will share with you today. Keep in mind, when I um, made this journal entry, it was, you know, it's based on that time frame back then, and Dylan was approximately one-third through his chemo treatment plan. Dylan was diagnosed on August 23rd, 2010 with human sarcoma, soft tissue, at the young age of nine. From my experience with my son, Dylan's diagnosis of human sarcoma, soft tissue, a rare childhood cancer, I feel it is very important that all pediatric oncologists be aware of all options for their patients' possible side effects both short-term and long-term, term, including experimental options. Being overwhelmed with the diagnosis of Dylan's cancer, his intensive chemotherapy treatment plan of nine months, and the seriousness of his situation, which, I'll, which I've never experienced before, of course, I relied on the doctors for information and options, if any, for Dylan. I soon found out I would have to do, educate myself, and that I did. Not only did I have to work whenever and as much as possible at a very busy law firm and care for a child dog diagnosed with cancer as a single mom, I had to educate myself on Dylan's cancer and both short-term and long-term side effects. After all the initial testing results performed, Excuse me. After all of the initial testing results performed to determine whether or not Dylan's cancer had spread came back negative, I felt confident that Dylan's cancer was gone and wanted to do something more for my son other than just be there. 
like I always am, like I always have been. I was now looking to see what I could do to help lessen or eliminate any of the possible long-term side effects he could get. I want to do anything I can for Dylan to help him have an as normal post-cancer life after his chemo treatment as possible. While at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida on December 1st, 2010, I stopped in the sarcoma clinic where in the lobby they had pamphlets. And so what I did at that time is just would grab them and take them to read and put them in my bag. And so they had a pamphlet there from Fertile Hope called Cancer and Fertility for Patients and Survivors. I put it in with the rest of my educational materials and did not get a chance to read it until Dylan's next hospital stay on December 7th, which was during Dylan's 11th week of his chemo treatment plan. It wasn't until then I learned of an experimental procedure of to testicle tissue freezing for boys who haven't gone through puberty to try to preserve their fertility. I also learned that night through the risk calculator Fertile Hope has on their website that not only was Dylan at a risk for infertility, but at a high risk based on his cancer and the treatment for it. I was extremely upset. I learned that Dylan was now at a high risk as opposed to just a risk like I was told, and that there was an option available for him to try to preserve his fertility. Though it was an experimental option, it was still nonetheless an option. It was, then for, it was then further upset and disappointed, excuse me, I was then further upset and disappointed because ideally this procedure should be performed before chemo begins. I was afraid that I might have lost the only window of opportunity. That I had to do something for my son in his future. That night, I checked with the charge nurse, and she wasn't aware of this procedure and never heard of it. I checked with one of the doctors the next morning, and he too never heard of it. I expressed to both the charge nurse and the doctor that I was quite upset and disappointed that I was not made aware of this option for my son, and that now it might be too late because he's already had 11 weeks into his chemo treatment plan. Because this procedure of to testicle tissue freezing for before puberty boys was experimental, Dylan's doctors didn't show any interest in it. Again, I was off to do my own research, digging deeper to find out what it was all about and if in fact it was truly too late for Dylan because he, because of his soon to be 12 weeks into his chemo treatment plan. Through my research, I spoke and communicated with several helpful and wonderful people who ultimately connected me to Dr. Kyle Orwick. Dr. Orwick, um, this was at the time I wrote this, is an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh and researcher at McGee Women's Research Institute and Foundation. Dr. Orwick and I had many communications via emails and telephone calls about this experimental procedure of to testicle tissue cryopreservation for fertility and preservation. I was able to speak with one of Dr. Orwig's co-investigators, Dr. Glenn Cannon, a pediatric urologist. Dr. Cannon was able to answer all my questions about the procedure. Dr. Uh, Serena Dovey, another one of Dr. Orwig's co-investigators, was able to explain this procedure to Dylan's father. Dr. Orwick and his team of co-investigators agreed that even though Dylan was already in his 12th week of his chemo treatment plan, that there was still a good chance that he could still have stem cells and were willing to perform this procedure on Dylan. I was glad and nervous to hear that. Glad because Dylan had been given a second window of opportunity to have this procedure done, and nervous because I had to make an important decision for my son and his future. After many long, hard thoughts, consideration, and of course, getting Dylan's okay, I felt it would be worth a chance to take for Dylan and his future to have this to testicle tissue 
cryopreservation done in hopes to try to preserve his fertility for his future. Dylan and I flew to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on Wednesday, January 5th, 2011. Dylan had the procedure performed the next morning by Dr. Glenn Cannon at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and we flew back to Tampa, Tampa, Florida on Friday, January 7th, 2011. Dr. Cannon said that the testicle biopsy went well and that both Dr. Orwick and Dr. Dovey were, were pleased as well. Most importantly, the procedure went well for Dylan too. So far, so good, and that makes me feel good too. Time will tell the rest. The, par the parents and patients, if age appropriate, should be made aware of all options available to the patients, including the experimental ones. The doctors sh should notify the patients, if age appropriate, definitely the parents, with these options the same time they are discussing the treatment plan of their child's cancer. The doctors shouldn't feel like they are overwhelming them with more unnecessary information. It's important that the parents know all their options right up front so they don't risk losing a limited window of opportunity to do something for their child in their child's future. That way, the way that research, science, and technology have been progressing, and with the increased survival rate of childhood cancer, all the more reason for experimental options to be presented to the parents and patients if age appropriate. Doctors should not think less of an experimental option and not provide that information to the parents, especially if it is one that might be of interest to them, just because it's experimental. It's the job of the doctors to provide all options for their patients and parents, and they should include experimental ones too. Let it be the parents and, pa and patients be the ones to make the decision on the experimental options and not for the failure of the doctors to provide that information to them. That's more stressful and disappointing. It could have been a totally unnecessary lost opportunity for the parents and the patients. It's also helpful and less stressful if the doctors provide as much information, educational materials, and resources to their parents and patients or have them made readily available and clearly marked where they can get this information at their offices. To have to deal with a recent diagnosis of your child having cancer is overwhelming enough, never mind having to do your own education, educating too. Whether I fell through the cracks or not, I can't imagine that I'm the only parent to feel this way. Hopefully our story will bring a different light on the issue of experimental options and education for their, for their parents and their patients too. Um, I also wanted to share something too, if I could. Um, nine years ago, as a result of my son's cancer journey, um, we started an organization to help other pediatric cancer families and uh, believe that it was inspired by God as well. It's called uh, Kids Campaign, and it stands for Kindness and Doing Service. We have a dual mission, first to instill kindness through sponsored community service activities, second to share love with pediatric cancer families by easing their burdens and celebrating their joy. Our website is kidscampaignsharinglove.org. And if anyone wants my contact information, I have that I to give them if they have any questions or anything. Um, or would like to find out more information. And again, I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Kyle Orwick, his lovely wife, Jen, and their great team for the hope you all bring for the gift of life and humanity. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Brandon Lishner. I'm sure I won't be near as good at telling my story as she was. Um, <clears throat> but so in 2000, I was 18. Um, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Um, I had noticed a lump and 
I was 18. I didn't have any pain or anything. I didn't never cancer never even crossed my mind. Um, then I ended up having some stomach cramps. I went to the hospital. Um, they did the surgery that day. Um, after they did the uh, ultrasound. Um, and the doctor at the time, he did stress the importance of uh, storing sperm, so I did. Um, and I was 18. Uh, about two years after that, I, like I said, I was 18. I didn't even think about having kids at the time. Um, so I, I couldn't really afford to keep storing the sperm, so I, I didn't. Um, that being said, I didn't have any of the information that, you know, it seems like is out there now, or if it was out there, I wasn't given that information or didn't know how to get it. Um, so went uh, about, about 13 years, I was 32 years old. Um, I had testicular cancer again for a second time in the other testicle. So the urologist at the time, um, Dr. Uh, O'Goggin, Pretty much without forcing me, he, he, he made me go store sperm. I, I was more interested at the time in having the surgery. I didn't know how long, it, you know, I had had it before I had found it, how long it had been. I wanted to get that done, but he, uh, very grateful for him. Uh, so I did. I went, I came to down to uh, McGee three times. I stored, you know, stored the sperm. My sperm counts were really low. Um, I found out they were probably in the teens. Um, I mean, it was very, very low. Um, Dr. Goggin actually, he called to check and make sure that, that I did it as many times as I said. He, he was, <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't trust me, but it, you know, he was, uh, he, he was on it. Um, he's, he's been a great doctor all the way through. Um, so, about two years after after that, I guess we decided, uh, my wife and I, that we we did, we wanted to have kids. So we went to back down to McGee to, and talked to Dr. Joaquim. He did, you know, all the tests on my wife. Everything seemed seemed great, like it should be a go. Um, so we went through the whole, you know, in vitro process. Um, and uh, they said we had about a, a one in 100,000 chance of, of having having our son um, we ended up at, with a total of uh, five embryos two of them they implanted um, only one took obviously have, uh, we have one son he's five uh, the other embryos didn't survive long enough to to freeze to keep um, so I guess basically that that's the story I guess that, you know it's nice to see now that you know the information's out there. It seems like there's organizations that are trying to get the information out there to the younger younger people. Um, you know, even I guess it should be out there even beforehand, before you even have a diagnosis. I mean, it was you know, if I'd have had the information that's out there now, or that I maybe it was, I just didn't know. But if, that I see today, I think I would have thought differently about it. So I'm very grateful for everybody out there that's doing what you're doing. Thank you. turn for therapy in front of 300 people. <laughs> very exciting. Um, my name is Alyssa Kelly. I am the very proud mother of two amazing children. Um, my son Emmett is 16 and my daughter Evelyn is 12 and she is a cancer survivor. When Evelyn was three and a half, she was diagnosed with a pericardial rhabdomyer sarcoma. Um, at the time of diagnosis, um, we, in that moment in the small, awful room that you all have these discussions in, um, the discussion of oncofertility was discussed. Um, my children are the most amazing thing to ever happen to me, and I wanted that option for Evelyn if she so chooses it. Um, and so I want to thank you all for making my dreams come true of giving Evelyn options for either fertility or puberty if she needs it. Thank you.
now I think comes the real therapy. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for sharing your stories. You did your work. I had tears. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask each of you a few questions, but the one I, one I want to start with is that uh, all of you uh, had uh, outcomes uh, where your children survived your cancer, or in your case, uh, you survived the cancer. Uh, I'd like to hear about, about your kids. How are they doing? Do they talk about the fertility issues um, and the procedures that they had to go through to do that? Uh, this is obviously for Christine and Alyssa. Um, so Evelyn was three and a half when she had cancer. She has very limited memories of the hospital um, and her treatment. All of them are positive, which is the craziest thing to me, but wonderful. Um, so we told her maybe a few years ago that um, she has an ovary in a freezer in Minnesota and um, in case she needs it to either start um, puberty or to have kids and she was pretty good with that and moved on. Um, <laughs> she has started the initial um, stages of puberty and she would be thrilled that I'm telling you all of this. Um, so there's not much else to say about that. Um, so for me, my son Dylan was nine at the time and pretty, pretty bright nine-year-old. He pretty much got things pretty quickly. And so Dylan during his chemo treatment was very, very rough. Um, he had to, we had to pre-medicate him to access his port. His anxiety was through the roof. It was just horrible. And so I knew that this would be, this is something that I thought I wanted to do for his future, but I knew that he would have to be okay with it or it wasn't gonna happen. So I researched it first, and as I learned things, I shared things with Dylan, and then when I was getting ready to feel comfortable to make a decision, like, I wanna do this, but I'm not gonna do it if he's not on board. So I sat down with my son and I told him, I said, so this is how it's gonna go. Take a little bit of your tissue and save it and test it and make sure there's stuff there in case you want. So he says to me, so I'm gonna be a guinea pig? <laughs> and so I'm like, well, yeah, I guess that's, yeah. And he said, okay, Ma. And I said, okay. And then we firmed up things with Kyle and off we were. I have to say, if you hadn't said the guinea pig thing, I would have. <laughs> um, and because I remember that part of the story uh, too. I'm also amazed as you're reading your diary the depth which, with, with which you understood everything that was, uh, was going on. Christine was a tremendous researcher. She really was and got all of her ducks in a row. And by the way, it wasn't just our team she pulled together. We had a conference call. This is before Zoom. Uh, where she pulled together also Jill Ginsburg from Philadelphia because they had a protocol as well. Uh, Dylan wasn't eligible for their protocol and Christine asked really smart questions about why is this experimental thing okay to do in Pittsburgh but it's not okay to do in Philadelphia? Don't you all follow the same rules? <laughs> I like a rule breaker. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and in fact, our rules are generally the same, but there are also, as you all know, nuances um, in, in our protocols. And it turns out that although we had to do a little fudging with our protocol as well and change it as a result, um, that she was eligible in Pittsburgh. And just imagine what a brave thing that is uh, for someone to come and be the first patient in a program who's never frozen a testicular tissue before. Yeah. Thanks to you and your amazing team. Um, Brandon, can you tell us about your child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my son, his name's Lorenzo. Um, he's five years old now. He's in preschool. Uh, he's he's doing doing great. He has uh, he's, he's hasn't had a haircut since he was born. So he, <laughs> he has really really long hair. But I mean, other than that, he everything so far seems to be good. He's uh, I tell everybody he's wild, just like his mom. <laughs> Um, Alyssa, I first became familiar with your family actually at an oncofertility meeting like this on a patient advocate panel when uh, your dad uh, was the advocate sitting at the panel. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the words that he said uh, on the panel that day 
we're, we're a family full of doctors and physicians, or doctors and lawyers. We're really smart people, and we had no idea what to do in this particular uh, circumstance. I know he expressed that he was grateful this, for the support. Sorry. Uh, grateful for the support that was available at Lurie Children's Hospital and, and Northwestern University. Uh, I also learned at the time, uh, because we've been uh, fortunate to have the support of the foundation that was established by your family, uh, PORF, I don't know if it's still functional or not, um, but can you tell us a little bit about that, and particularly I have a yellow book sitting on my desk that I think is the coolest thing ever. Um, my parents started a pediatric oncofertility foundation. Um, it supports oncofertility research. Um, it's, we don't have big funds, but we do like to give them away when we have them. Um, and my son, um, in an effort to help my son go navigate all of this, he's not a talker at all, um, and he wasn't then. He, he came, he was born a 50-year-old man, and so he's just not a big talker. So when Evelyn was going through treatment, he was eight, um, going on nine, and um, my dad decided to help him write a book to talk about what's it like to have a sibling with cancer. Um, and it's called My Sister Got Cancer. Um, you can actually buy it on Amazon. Um, it's wonderful. I'm a little biased. Um, <laughs> but it describes what it's like to be sick, the treatments in, in a way that children can understand, um, and adults can understand at some level. You know, the parents can only take in so much, and then it's like, okay, what was said, and what is this test, and so. Um, it, it was a way for Emmett to express himself um, through this book. And it was, it was interesting, some things that were in there. Um, you know, his sister was bald, and people would ask, why is your sister bald? And um, so um, he talked about that a little bit in the book. And it's a workbook for children, so there's questions at the end. And... Um, to say, well, what's it like when you have a sibling, with your sibling, and what kind of treatments did your sibling need? Um, so I'm very proud of it. It's, it's really cool. Actually, it just went, so it's been sitting in our lab for a long time, actually at the end of a lab bench, and I was thinking about it recently as we were coming up to this meeting. It's always been sitting there. I don't think anybody knows it's there or what it is, and so I went searching through the laboratory, and sure enough, it was buried under something, and I, I pulled it out. Um, really terrific. Um, I don't want to monopolize the time with the patient advocate panel. If there's anybody uh, in the audience who has, uh, has questions, uh, please come to the microphone. I can ask some more questions, but also we don't need to go on uh, ad nauseum. But please uh, come to the microphone if you have uh, questions. I'll lead off with uh, just one more. Um, Christine, you made a, a strong point about how difficult it was for you to get your information and that you had to be really yours and your son's uh, best advocates. Brandon, it sounds like you uh, got information uh, really uh, proactively uh, and appropriately. Did I catch that correctly? Um, Alyssa, how was it for you guys in Chicago? This was early, very early stages, I think, for freezing ovarian and testicular tissues in this um, country. Barb Lockhart was our nurse practitioner. She's in the back there. She's the best. Um, she's seen me at my worst. Yeah, she saw me during the tears of endearment moments. Um, it's okay to laugh about that. So um, Barb was there when um, we were told, Barb took, Barb was, in the little room when we were told that Evelyn had cancer and um, she had some cardiac compromise. Barb, you can correct me if I'm wrong with any of this. She had some cardiac compromise uh, because her tumor was huge. It was, I think, the size of her heart, if not maybe slightly larger, all in her pericardium. So um, we were inpatient for um, six days before we were told of her final path. Um, and so they told us that she had, um, during that time we were on the HEMOC floor, even though I said, oh, we don't belong here. She's not a cancer patient. 
people just looked at me like I had three heads. Um, and so I, but I thought it could be. So I was thinking about it and I thought, I want her ovaries removed. Um, thinking she had just big, huge ovaries of three and a half, I'm not sure why. Um, but I wanted to have them removed because I knew that she was gonna be getting poison at least she was going to be getting the chemo um, if she did have cancer. So um, it was, we were told that she had cancer. And then in that conversation, I said, I want her ovaries removed. And her doctor said, well, we can do that, actually. Um, and then I think Barb had the conversation with us right then and there. Um, and, you know, it was something for us to focus on. Um, it was something positive to focus on. Um, because we just kept saying, well, they're not going to offer that if they don't think she's going to make it. Um, so that's where we focused. Um, that's what we talked about, that's all we talked about, um, but we focused on the fertility preservation. And yes, it was very early stages. I think she may have been one of the youngest or the youngest at the time of being three and a half in 2013 of having her tissue preserved. So that's what you all do, provide hope. And thank you for telling your stories because you guys really are the inspiration and the motivation for what we all do in the room. I see James coming to a microphone. Hi, I'm James Klosky from um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Uh, you're very brave in front of all these people and uh, telling us a little bit about your lives. If I understood it correctly, um, you each have kids, one age 21, one age 12, and one age five. Can you talk a little bit about um, any messages or do they talk about wanting to be a parent? Are they starting to think about that? Um, they're all three at such different developmental stages. I would love to hear any messages that they're kind of talking to you about now. That's for you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, they, I mean, my son doesn't even really, he doesn't even know, never even, told him at this point about any of it so um, you know we just kind of monitor him just because of my situation we take him to the doctor regularly but uh, uh, I'm not sure he even knows why yet so he doesn't really talk about it much so uh, my son Dylan probably at the age of maybe seven or so just talking, you know, things, and he liked babies, and he, I remember him making a statement at one time, one day I'm going to have ten kids, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, he was probably like maybe seven, and he got diagnosed with cancer at nine, so I remember that, but um, I just, I don't know what, he's 21 now, he doesn't have a girlfriend that I'm aware of anyways, <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what he's going to do with his young life, but I, I know for me as his mom, um, I felt like so much was taken from him, his childhood, that if I could help him have as close to a normal life as post-cancer as possible, that I felt that was hope for me to be able to do that for him. So that, like she said, it gave me something to focus on, something I had to do more for my child than just be there because I'm from I'm there every day for my child. So uh, to to just I had to do more, you know. And I stumbled across that and Kyle and his team. It was a, it was a blessing for us and it was hope for us. And whether he needs it or not, that choice will be his to make if and when the time comes. I'm just grateful to you all that it's there for him if he chooses and he needs it. Thank you. Leslie? Um, Evelyn oh, doesn't sorry. really talk about it, um, but, you know, she's tough. She's the toughest kid. She's the bravest kid. Who better to be a parent? Um, you know, all those kids that have been through cancer, 
They're tough, they're resilient, they're wise beyond their years. I just can't think who would be better as parents if they so choose. Thank Listen. you all for sharing your stories. It takes a lot of courage and we appreciate it. I just want to comment on two things you said, um, the mom on the left, that really, although it's a lot of information that we're giving you, you still want to hear it. And I think that's important for all of us to hear because I think sometimes we're worried that we're overwhelming you and it's not the right time. But I think everyone in this room can appreciate that you want the information and you will let us know when you've heard enough and when you want to hear more. So thank you for bringing that up. And then I also wanted to make a comment about the prognosis. You know, that's one area where we struggle with that if the child has a difficult prognosis, but cancer therapies are being given because we think these patients are going to live. And so we should be offering fertility preservation services and at least having the discussion with you as parents and letting you partake in that conversation about your child. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and they bring up very excellent points for us as providers. And that was a nice uh, plug for one of our sessions tomorrow morning about patients with poor prognoses and what to do about fertility decisions in that uh, context. Adelina? Yeah, so uh, just echoing what Leslie and James said, you know, thank you so much for sharing your stories. I think there are many tears being held back in the room. Um, so we just really appreciate you coming here and reminding us of why we try to do the things we do. I have one question for Brandon. You know, I, I think sometimes we are counseling uh, teenage boys, for instance, for sperm banking, and uh, it's a tough age uh, because, you know, it's not like the little kids where the parents are truly the um, main decision makers. You know, sometimes these kids are 14, 15, so it really needs to be a shared decision. And sometimes though, at that age, um, you know, there's a lot of emotions at play, and we'll hear a teenage boy saying, you know what, I don't really want to think about that right now, or um, that's tomorrow's problem, not today's problem. So I just was curious if you have any advice of how, you know, someone like us can, can speak to that. Yeah, I, you know, that is a good point. It isn't like it's an awkward age to have conversations like that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how you would overcome the awkwardness of that, but I, <laughs> I do agree that, I mean, I do think that it, it, it should be put out there somehow, some way, um, you know, even just the fact of the, you know, just testicular cancer in general um, is, uh, you know, for me, from my experiences, you know, when I was 18, I didn't even know, I didn't even know it existed to be honest, so it never even crossed my mind that that would be, you know, an option for what was going on with me. Um, but maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe it would be a good idea if you could, you know, if, if information could be sent out even just to parents or given to just parents and, and, you know, allow them to make the decision to have the conversation with their children. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a good option. Um, I really don't have a. I really don't have a good answer. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hey, I'm, I'm Brooke Shervin. I'm from um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Thank you. I echo what everyone else has said. It's brave to stand up there. I was just sweating up there, nervous a few minutes ago. So I'm I'm glad you're here to share with us. Um, I often think about how our how parents, myself included, as a parent, like to be um, the primary source of of some sensitive information sometimes for their children. And I was just wondering, for those of you who have talked to your children as they're now you know, getting older about their, how their treatment impacted their fertility, what it meant to preserve this tissue, did you find those conversations difficult? Would you, did you have resources from your clinical team to help kind of navigate explaining that to your child when they got to at ages where they were having more questions or where you felt like they needed to know that? Um, Evelyn, so um, she has what we call marks. I don't call them scars. I feel like scars has a negative 
connotation to it. So she has a mark on her belly where her um, ovary was removed. And she says, well, what's this? Because we call her um, chest mark the mark that she's the bravest girl, and then her port mark that she's the, no, strongest, bravest. There we go. And then she goes, well, what's this mark? And I was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> and I wasn't <laughs> ready for that. Um, and I was, you know, this was a few years ago, so she may have been nine or 10. Um, I was certainly more anxious about it than she was. Like, I was expecting it to be this huge conversation, and it was like, oh, okay. And then she moved on. Um, I'm sure at some point she'll ask more questions. Um, I'm a nurse, I'm an ER nurse by background, so um, I felt comfortable having that brief little conversation with her. Um, but I'm sure I can reach out to the treatment team for resources, I'm sure they have them. So for me, um, I like to talk, except in front of a crowd like this. <laughs> um, but um, I like to talk and I'm pretty straight forward and honest, probably say too much sometimes to my son at a young age, but um, when we were going through it, I explained it to him as we were learning from Kyle and his team and the steps and you know any questions you had, I encouraged him to ask, you know, I'm not the only one here, you can ask too. And so after the procedure, we, we just kind of like, okay, it's done, it looks good, it's in the bank, and we're just going to go on with life, and we just go on with life until... We hear from Kyle again about something or this conference or whatever, you know, and then I'm like, oh yeah, okay. And, and so, so my son just turned 21, um, as I said, on March 29th, and last year we went to a follow up with his oncologist and, you know, so he knows it's there and he knows about it, but he just kind of goes on with life like, okay, doing whatever he's gonna do. So I guess when he finds that special someone is when it will come up with, okay, now, what are we going to do if he decides that he wants to see if his sperm is, you know, good before he gets in a relationship? I don't know. I might encourage him that if I know anything about his life. <laughs> but, you know, so, yeah, so we just kind of, we got it in the bank and we just go on with life and take it one day at a time. And when it comes up, I'll deal with it and I'll help him if need be. And that's it. Yasmin? Thank you. Um, thanks again. Um, I'm one of the clinicians from Australia and run an oncofertility program there. And um, you've given us a lot of strength today to, you know, keep the programs going and, you know, just more determination to keep going. Um, I had a question, and I'm not sure if I heard um, this correctly, Brandon, actually. Um, I think I heard you mention that if you'd known more, even maybe before the diagnosis, um, and I'm not sure if I heard that right, because I have actually wondered about, well, general community education, and sometimes we're talking to families at a really difficult time, and um, would knowing before that um, diagnosis actually help that awareness, knowing what you would do? Yeah, I mean, I think in my situation more, if I had to know, even if I'd have been given the information after my diagnosis, um, would have helped me make a, a, a better decision uh, at the time. Like I said, the doctor, he, you know, I mean, he, he did explain to me the situation, but I guess without, you know, hearing things like you, you that I heard today and the information it seems like it's been being given now um, would have, you know, I guess I'd have been much more educated to make the decision. Um, so I guess I, it doesn't necessarily have to be before the diagnosis, but the information is there now, I think, it seems that yeah. could help. And as long as the doctors are, you know, telling you how to access that information to get, mm -hmm. you know, so you can make an educated decision, I, I feel like it, had I known any of that, I would have definitely found a way to, or just continue to to keep my, my sperm in the sperm bank there and, you know, hopefully maybe had a, a you know, more opportunity to have more children. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, awareness. Yeah. Education. Yeah. Like I said, it may have been there when I, you know, when I was going through it, but I didn't, I didn't, nobody ever told me how to get it or. Yeah. 
maybe I didn't at 18, I didn't dig in deep enough, but there wasn't anybody there to kind of push me along, you know. Well, I think your story is educational for all of us, uh, too, because generally a man would uh, produce and is ejaculate about 40 million sperm. And so uh, sometimes when you see a sperm count that's really low, it's discounted as if uh, that's not, not good enough and not worthwhile to save. In fact, that's what happens in some clinics. They have a threshold. So to hear that uh, with very low sperm numbers, you said numbering in the teens, you had a wonderful outcome uh, from that. And, and certainly we all, at least we should know, it takes one sperm to fertilize an egg, but I think sometimes we forget it. Uh, when we've got our clinical protocols and ways that we do things and so understanding that uh, that 17 or whatever number of sperm it was was good enough uh, to achieve the most important result is really yeah. inspiring. Yeah, I mean he didn't even bat an eye at it. He just, he said, let's, let's give it a shot. That's so, terrific. Know. Well, if there are no other questions from the floor, I'll thank our panelists who traveled both from near and far to come and share their stories uh, with us. And uh, to close this session, I'd like to invite uh, Michael Anakin to the stage. He's the CEO of McGee Women's Research Institute and Foundation and one of the supporters of this meeting. Michael. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, I want to say thank you for taking this journey with us because, honestly, without your willingness to take a chance, we wouldn't get where we're going in the future of science. So we appreciate that. So thank you. Okay, so I, uh, you know, I also have a patient advocate story. As, as a brand new CEO in 2016, I didn't have my office ready yet, so they were moving me around the building. And I was in little cubes while they were building out my office. And, and you know, with, within probably my first week of the job, maybe my third day, I think, uh, I'm in a cube and I'm pouring over financial data, right? The first meeting I had was with the CFO and I'm looking at lots of financial data as one would do as a new CEO coming into an organization. And my phone keeps ringing. And I'm not answering it because I have a secretary for that, right? I'm busy looking at financial data but it keeps ringing, and so it's not kicking out to the secretary. So finally I say, well, it must be time to take a break, and I answer the phone. And there's a mother on the other end of the phone that says to me, excuse me, my son who's eight was just diagnosed with cancer, and I need to preserve his fertility. Who can I talk to? <laughs> and, and I was like, uh, hold on one second. So I put her on hold. I learned how to use the phone system. I put her on hold. I run out and find my secretary and say, how can we, who, who does that? There's no way, right? And she says, oh no, we do that. Kyle does that. So <laughs> that's how I learned about the amazing things we could do. I mean, look, I was not from the medical space, so I didn't know uh, a lot of things, but I did know that an eight-year-old hadn't gone through puberty yet, and it would be very difficult to preserve fertility for somebody who hadn't yet had any fertility. So what you do is absolutely amazing, and we're extremely excited to not only support Kyle's work here in Pittsburgh and his team here in Pittsburgh, but his collaborations with many of you. And this year, although this is year number 14 for the Onco Fertility Consortium, this is our first year hosting it. So we're extremely excited to host it. So thank you for coming to Pittsburgh. Thank you for sharing your ideas with us. Thank you for leading the space forward. In Pittsburgh, we have uh, what we call a life science hub here because of UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh and, and some of the innovation ecosystem that resides within the city of Pittsburgh, we truly understand what it takes to take bench discoveries, basic science discoveries, and translate them into clinical outcomes. And notice I said clinical outcomes because ultimately that's the end goal. That's the end goal, and we know that, and we're very laser focused on that. So it's organizations like this, and it's constituencies like you coming to Pittsburgh to help us achieve that mission that we absolutely need in order to keep moving forward. So I wanna say thank you for your participation today with us. Thank you for your participation year round, and thank you for helping us move this science forward because it really takes all of us in this room working together to be able to support families like this and improve those clinical outcomes. So we're gonna start with a round of applause for you guys. Thank you very much. 
I want to thank the sponsors that made this happen. You know, uh, this, is a, this is a pretty big conference, and it was something that I know we were concerned about being able to pull off. We had COVID. We had some obstacles. But the sponsors really stepped up, and they said, the, the show must go on. We're getting, back, we're getting back to seeing each other. We want to do what's right for the organization. The Onco Fertility Consortium has pushed through many obstacles. And so thank you to the sponsors for sticking with us, and thank you for helping us put this on today. Now, I know there's a lot more work to be done. I know that organizations like this and, and conferences like today just are really the start. And we're committed to pushing forward and helping provide funding and helping provide ideas and opportunities to continue that process. So we will be with this in, in, in for years to come, but I also know that I'm standing in between you and the drinks. So I, I, looked, I looked at this and it said, welcome. And they said reception. I said, I'm giving, I'm giving a welcome speech to close, the, to close the day. So I think I'm supposed to be welcoming you to the reception. So thank you for coming to Pittsburgh. Thank you for spending the, the couple of days with us that you're going to spend with us. Have a good time tonight at the reception. I look forward to meeting as many of you as I can. Thank you.